We are live. Um, good morning from UK. And uh, if you are in Asia, uh, Far East or Southeast Asia, uh, good afternoon and early good evening to all of you. Um, I'm Zani. I'm hosting this uh, Democratic Struggles uh, Dialogue across uh, Asia. And I have an honor and distinct pleasure to host a friend and uh, a very distinguished uh, journalist, uh, Didi Kirsten Tudlow. She's based in Berlin, uh, a native of Hong Kong, um, born and raised there, educated, and then like, um, you know, did her studies at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, here in London. And uh, she has covered as a journalist, a scholar, um, China and, uh, you know, Asia, particularly China for over 23 years for, um, you know, a very influential and in prestigious um, news outlets such as New York Times, as well as her hometown paper, the South China Morning Post. And she's currently uh, holding two fellowships. Um, you know, she's a, a senior fellow in the Asia program at the um, German Council on Foreign Relations and also with the um, a Czech um, think tank in Prague. Um, I believe that it's called Project Synopsis. Synopsis. That's it. Uh, yeah. And <laughs> also, she she has. I'm sorry, my uh, um, my Czech is not um, uh, existent. Um, she's also <laughs> co yeah co editor <laughs> and uh, um, author co author of Routledge publication, a monograph entitled uh, China's Quest for Technology Beyond Espionage. Um, it just came out last year. And she also wrote a cover investigative piece uh, on how China uses uh, civil society and civic as well as um, educational institutions in the United States for Newsweek. Um, you know, that was uh, uh, almost or a little over a year ago. And so today, um, Didi will talk about uh, basically very, very foundational issues about China. There's so much misunderstanding propaganda, and, you know, this like folk uh, propaganda um, <clears throat> about China. And, uh, you know, none of us would want to see any type of China bashing per se, but we do have to understand the rise of China and its global impact. And uh, the, to understand China's impact, that uh, we need to understand first uh, what China is and what uh, who is ruling or running um, things in China. So, Didi, um, without further ado, let me um, let me give you the floor to to discuss um, what China really is and how we should understand at the most important elemental level. Wow, yeah, thank you very, very much, Sani. It's really nice to be here um, again and um, to share with, with you all a vision um, and a, I guess a life experience of China, which is maybe a bit different from uh, that of many people now in the so-called West um, and elsewhere, um, Southeast Asia, Australia, I mean, really everywhere, who, you know, didn't kind of come from the place. and. I'm not, you know, trying to set up any special um, um, knowledge for myself in that sense. It's just I think it's about lived experience and authentic experience and, you know, the experience that you just gather about a place from having lived there for a very, very long time. Um, and it can be things that are just part of everyday life. And it all goes into this big picture of how you understand what's actually going on somewhere. And I think this is a huge challenge now that we have in the world because there are really very few people who've had that kind of experience of China in a really granular personal level, as well as an intellectual and analytical level. Um, and yet we're all trying to deal with the rise of China um, to make it safe for people, for individuals uh, in China and outside China, and um, to deal with trade problems, um, all kinds of stuff. Um, technology is an area that I've looked at quite closely, uh, and China's very, very large decades old programs um, set up by the Communist Party to um, extract technology from around the world, not just in America or Europe, but also from Japan, from South Korea, um, 
from, from Australia, for example, um, bring it back to China, commercialize it, and in that way, um, feed China's economic rise and also its state building, because technology ultimately is about state building. You can just think about the issue of how do people communicate in a government or how do they run their societies, their traffic systems, um, you know, and then you can think about surveillance and the, the incredible surveillance issues that we're seeing in China as they're growing almost untrammeled, really, by uh, any considerations of um of, of what are people's rights to be surveyed or to be not surveyed. So um, it's it's a big topic, I'm very happy to be here and Zani for you to, for us to sort of debate as well and to take all kinds of questions as they may pop up from audience, but I'll leave that over to you Zani, You're, you will be managing the chat. Um, you know, where where even to begin? I, I, I guess for me coming from Hong Kong, born and raised, and I was very um, happy about that always. Um, uh, I saw in the um, in the uh, advertisements or tweets for this event that uh, I was described as being she was from Hong Kong. You know, I, I still am from Hong Kong. You're um, a Hong Konger. I right? am. Well, I thank mean, you very you much. Yeah. There, and then yeah, you I was. I still and am. Then you yeah. went to Chinese school. But I have, but you see, I've always, from the very beginning, I, I am, you know, of, of uh, you know, I'm not from Hong Kong in the sense of being of ethnic Chinese descent, which is how the Hong Kong government and the Chinese government judges people. So, you know, there was always this kind of ethnic tension there, I think. And um, now, indeed, to this day, um, my status in Hong Kong, despite being born there, it's not the same as the status of somebody who is of ethnic Chinese descent. And um, I have, you know, if I don't go back every three years, I lose my right to land, my right to work and my right to vote. Not that it really makes any difference anymore. Um, but, um, you know, so there's a kind of a racism there, too. And people will say, well, gosh, well, why would you care? You know, you're so-called Caucasian. So, you know, but actually, I think people do care because this is a question of individual belonging. It's a question of rights. And that goes in, in different directions, you know. Um, and when you see the very liberal um, immigration regimes that, that are in many dem democratic countries, you understand um, that it, what, a, what a pity it is that it doesn't work the other way around, for example, that you can't, you know, China takes in very, very few immigrants, practically none, actually. They just don't trust them. They just don't even go there. And, and you know, when you compare that to the discussion we have in, in the UK or in Germany or in the US about immigration as a strength, or of course there are people who are anti-immigration and that's just to get, you get into crazy territory. Um, but it, it's just not the same, is it? It's like we don't expect China to, to be generous in that sense in the way that we do expect the US to be generous. And rightly so, we hold the US to high standards. And I think this gets to the first point that I like to make which is that what are the, you know, why do we treat China so differently um, than, for example, the US? Um, and well, obviously there's a his, there are lots of historical reasons for that. Um, and um, there's the, 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 the history of colonialism, uh, which is very difficult. It remains difficult to this day for the West, but ultimately, you know, um, as China rises, we are gonna have to deal with these issues and we are gonna have to, um, challenge China, I think, to be more um, transparent, more communicative, more sharing, um, to, to take on responsibility for more things. Um, and the question then is, you know, how will it do that? Can it even do that? And I'm afraid that here, you know, we, we very quickly need to then, of course, to analyze what is the political system in China, that has created um, this rising power and what is its nature? What is it like? And here, um, you know, we need to call things what they are. We need, need to be able to say, as a, a friend of mine at uh, Synopsis says, we need to be able to call a cat a cat and say that China is a communist party ruled uh, country. And that means some very specific things. For example, it means a very powerful Leninist uh, tradition and um, political organization. And that means that it's, it is 
paranoid, yes. It's conspiratorial, yes. These things are written into the party charter. They're written into the constitution. It's all over the place. And we need to understand that so much of what China does is actually still to this day conducted um, and here I refer to the government, of course, and to party members and its actions internationally as well as at home um, in these rather conspiratorial hidden ways. Now, you know, how are we going to cope with that? Added to that modern political identity, if you like, is a very old, very tyrannical ident um, tradition in China. It's the tradition of the emperors who were the sons of heaven. Um, this stuff is not mere cliche, it's real. There are power traditions in social organization, in language. Um, and increasingly, we see the Communist Party drawing on those old um, despotic traditions, um, which, of course, are you know, very quickly followed by many people. These things go very deep into a psyche, into a culture, don't they? Uh, into family, intergenerational issues, all kinds of stuff. Um, they're embedded in the language, uh, in the philosophy, in the, you know, and it's very interesting to me that um, uh, I heard quite reliably, I believe, in um, a couple of years ago that just before Xi Jinping, the general secretary, the Communist Party, took power in 2012, um, he was reading around that time, he was reading the um, annals of the emperors Yao and Shun. Now, these are thousands of years old. They are about the earliest emperors of China and how they ran the show with central power, very, very, very concentrated. And yeah, well, imperially, tyrannically. And he was reading this, why? He was reading this for tips on governance. And I think this is something that we barely know, really. We don't really think about this too much. No, I, I, I think like I, I can um, totally see the parallels between, mm. you know, the what we might call um, the civilizational states like yeah. Russia, for instance, right? And, yeah. and R Russia has never felt comfortable uh, among the uh, European uh, community, if you will. Right, not entirely, right. right. And yeah. uh, mm -hmm. but because, it, you know, the, the um, I think the parallel between China and Russia, you know, the, what's interesting is like on, I mean, you mentioned, um, the um, you know no no one in their mind would seek refuge and protection from persecution in these massive civilizational states and they're also you know mm. co-founders of the united nations basically yes right? yeah 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 and, absolutely. and, 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 and uh, you know southeast asians living under different types of authoritarian autocratic regimes uh, you know, despite like thousands of miles of like um, boundaries uh, between their uh, persecuting countries and China, they would not dream of like uh, crossing over to China. You know, they yeah. would they would take the rickety boat journeys yeah. across the uh, Indian Ocean or Pacific Ocean to go yeah. somewhere else, like Vietnamese, for instance, right? True. And th this is this is quite an um, extraordinary phenomena because like you got like a uh, two massive, powerful. Uh, the uh, modern states with deep uh, feudal, tyrannical, yeah. imperial uh, the histories, right? And, and they are, they are, you know, despite hypocrisy of say European countries or mm. uh, the United States or Canada or Australia, you know, people seem to find these uh, even hypocritical Western li liberal states um, more attractive than you know, their own neighbors, for instance, yeah, like Ukraine absolutely. versus like uh, Russia, right? Can you, can you talk about, um, you, you tweeted um, that China is, a, um, is a, a, a culture, a civilization, and uh, how does your tweet square with the, um, you know, modern uh, 100 years old, um, you know, Chinese Communist Party built along, um, you know, Leninist lines? You know, like uh, I think like CCP has turned a hundred, and mm. uh, but it, you know, despite the anti-feudal, mm. you know, I mean, uh, Leninism, Marxism is about smashing feudal ethos, mindsets, institutions, structures, what have you, right? And then like how how does uh, how does this contradiction, um, you know, mm. mean to the Chinese? Uh, themselves mm. you know on one hand like drawing on deep imperial uh, you know tyrannical traditions of 
the middle kingdom, right? The center of the universe. And then on, on the other hand, you're talking about classless society and, and the feudalism is first and foremost about classes, right? Ruling mm, class absolutely. and the subject. And absolutely. Absolutely. Can, can, can you shed light on this, like your fundamental contradiction that CCP has when it attempts to manipulate the ancient tyrannical um, the history of uh, mm. imperial China? You know, it's interesting because um, at this point, I don't see it as a contradiction any longer. I see these as mutually self-reinforcing, mutually strengthening, almost almost like authoritarian learning um, um, situations and, and qualities. Um, you know, one thing about these civilizational states and about China is these very pure notions of race that they tend to have, yeah? Yeah. And, and there you get again to the to the issue of why people would be happier seeking a future in Canada, for example. Um, of course, people tried to go to China after the revolution in this sort of early wave of enthusiasm for communism, um, the idea of a new China. And many ethnic Chinese from around Southeast Asia did go back, Indonesia, uh, Vietnam, other places too, Thailand um, and Philippines. And Burma and as well. And Burma as well. There you go. And and um, you know, by and large, many of them had an absolutely awful time. They were persecuted eventually, or sooner or later, and um, many fled again. And many fled out through Hong Kong. And that, you know, by that time, when I was born in Hong Kong and a kid in the seventies, we were still seeing people fleeing every single day. You'd go to the beach, and there would be these sort of thing, these sort of big pieces of rubber from which flip-flops had been printed out for manufacturing and they'd be tied up with a string and had been used as a life raft to swim from mainland China to Hong Kong. And the British operated a very generous policy there called a touch base policy. If you made it to Hong Kong territory, you were in, you were safe, you registered for government housing, you got an ID card, you went and found a job. As a result, millions came. Now we can get as mad as we like about, you know, the UK and the US and Canada and the hypocrisies of the West. And I see these two, these are, you know, the US is a great power, great powers, um, well, you know, um, do tricky things. Um, but nevertheless, I really see that we, you know, that you need to look very carefully at where do people educate their children? Where do people buy property? And you know what? They're still sending Chinese people are still sending their kids to America to study. They're still sending their kids I mean, to Canada communist to study party to Australia, officials you know? themselves. Yeah. Well, Xi Jinping's own daughter went went to Harvard. <laughs> now, yeah, why why, why did that happen? Right? Why yeah, did he the, do the, that? The, the great patriot. Yeah, but the, but yeah. the question is like you know the, I, I was just having mm. a conversation with um, an academic friend a couple of days ago uh, about this issue. You know, like. Um, does liberal education mm. reshape uh, the, um, the, you know, for lack of a better word, uh, elite Chinese mind uh, to become more enlightened? And our conclusion is that, uh, you know, children of ruling elite coming to study in, you know, the Oxbridge uh, places or the Ivy League school or whatever, public IVs in the USA or Australia, they, they do not become enlightened yeah. or liberal yeah yeah you know i think that they do it, it, it's a, it, it, it can work in different ways at, at the same time right i think some people there is some change for sure of course exposure and friendships matter but um they they tend to fall back on their own their old sort of original power structures and if you come from a powerful family in china um and it can be a very uh, it, it power is inherited in China through the family, just as it is in in in, in other places. Despite being a communist nation, um, you know, well, you stick with you know what side your bread is buttered on, and you stick to it. No, you you, you very rarely get that kind of. Um, you know, great enthusiasm for big change. And we saw this immediately after the revolution in China. So a nominally communist state was being set up um, and the vast majority of communist cadres had only primary school education. I mean, you're really talking about kind of like Pol Pot level, sort of um, Cambodian level, like very poorly educated. I know some of it was a mixed picture, but a lot of these guys as well were very, very poorly educated. Um, and... Um, 
you know, these were the people who became the cadres and the organizers and the leaders and the power holders of the new China. Uh, and they immediately began to set up in their compounds in Beijing and elsewhere. They began to, re to set up these power hierarchies again. So if you were like a deputy secretary somewhere or deputy assistant minister, you had, you had different access to goods such as grain, oil for cooking, um, housing, accommodation, medical care, than a, than, a, than a higher person above you and their family. So these, these hierarchical structures, which are embedded in, in traditional Chinese society, immediately appeared again in, in the communist society, and they've been quite well described. So, so, so from what um, you know, I understand um, of, uh, your, from your explanation, the, um, the, the old... Uh, you know, power structures from within the society uh, get re-embedded within the CCP, right? So it isn't simply a party of card-carrying members, but it is a, it has a, a very close interlocking ties with the society at large. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Well, I, th I think it's not quite um, that. Um... I think that the Communist Party produced its own um, elite, yeah, its own aristocracy. That's what we see. And in fact, many of the obviously the previous elite were then destroyed. I mean, I mean we have to remember that um, maybe 50, maybe 60 million people were killed in China by the Communist Party. You mean the, during the Cultural Revolution? Or? I mean, beginning immediately, beginning with the revolution and even beforehand in Yan'an and the revolutionary base, there were purges, there were executions. Um, and uh, immediately, so, that they... so, so, so this this is the figure in addition to the um, uh, the Great Famine back right. to so it includes, failed right. agricultural policy. Right. So it figure, includes right? it includes a um, Great Leap Forward of approximately 1958, 59 to 61, um, where you know we the, the Chinese government itself has indicated that probably around 30 million people died of famine. Um, and disease, but also were also murdered, I mean, killed by uh, for political reasons during this time, it was, as it was an intensely political movement. Um, you know, it was about building the countryside and industrializing the countryside and people who didn't who didn't agree were, would be killed. Now, you know, was, they weren't always they didn't all die of famine, well, the many did. Um, other people think it's higher, think it may be around 40 million, something like this. So then you start adding on. Um, you know, the, the purges really began immediately after the revolution. There was a, all kinds of things like the four, the four this is the three that's, you know, the anti-landlord campaign in the early um, years. When I lived in China until 2017 um, and would go to the countryside near the Great Wall, for example, and would chat to people, villagers there, very, really nice people. And one of the, an older guy once told me that in their small village, um, about 18 people who were identified as landlords immediately after the revolution um, were going to be arrested and they fled the village for Beijing City, which was maybe about 90 kilometers away. They were trapped down in Beijing by the new communist um, party, which had eyes and ears everywhere already, because the communists essentially rose to power through intelligence. That's how they did it. This is very Leninist, yeah. Um, through an incredible network of intelligence agents and a system like that. Um, and they brought them all back to the village. They dragged them back and they shot them all. Yeah. Now, these people were not necessarily exploitative, terrible landlords of communist mythology. They would have been people who had a plot of land, who I'm sure had a family to care for, um, may even have been quite modest smallholders, for example. So this was the anti-landlord campaign. It began in blood and it continued through the 50s. We had the anti-rightist campaign at the end of the 50s. We then had the, in 1957, we then had the Great Leap Forward, which was the famine we've talked about, politically ordered, essentially. Um, and then we had the, the Cultural Revolution, which then struck, I mean, it really began at the latest in 1966. And um, we don't quite know how many people died then, but it was at least a couple of million um, Look, these are big numbers, you know, and, and if you were to compare how many people were killed directly or indirectly by Hitler and um, and by Mao, it's a pretty tight contest. So, you know, uh, Hitler is, is, is reviled, obviously, completely correctly around the world. And people are more ambiguous about Mao. Why is that? You know, 
Well, I did throw in uh, Stalin as well. You throw in Stalin as well, and you have a lovely group of blokes, right? Yeah. <laughs> no offense. <Yeah. laughs> but, you know, some very violent, violent men. And we're still, and you know, unlike Hitler, unlike Stalin, there has never been a reckoning with Mao in China. Mao still lies in the center of Beijing, in the center of the biggest square, his embalmed body is still there and people file past it pretty much every day in honor. So what does that tell us about the state of the country today? I think it tells us still that a very, very violent man is honored in China well, I th- I think to like, you know, day. To, yeah, yeah. To, to draw a parallel, I think like, you know, uh, uh, Putin just shut down any type of investigation into Stalin's crime, right? Yeah. And so, you know, the, I mean, that's just a side comment. Yeah. But I, 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 I want I want to get back to the um, the the um, the question of, uh, you know, the uh, CCP and how it operates at home and how uh, it's ruling elite uh, self perceive uh, vis a vis you know, the rest of the world. In other words, how do they see themselves? You know, wh- how do they see their place in the world? In the world? Um, well, I think they see themselves very much as the rightful rulers of China. And therefore, as China rises, as the people who have a right um, to be influential in the world, who have a right to um, shape the world, and I mean the whole world. So it's sort of really interesting how the Communist Party is very clever. And, you know, it has indeed um, produced great wealth at home, a lot of it off technological um, acquisition by all means or by multiple means, as the formula is called by the government, which involves a lot of um, unfair extraction, if you like, and some outright illegal extraction. And we can get to that later. Um, But as you know, so it has obviously created great wealth and this has obviously created support as well. So there's, you know, one needs to talk about China Um, you know, in a a differentiated way to to make an obvious point and acknowledge, you know, the the economic progress. But you can also turn that around and say, well, you know, they really needed this economic progress, um, which the communists did deliver after 1978 because they destroyed the country before 1978. They were coming off a very, very low base. Um, And China before 1949 was, apart from the World War II, the Japanese invasion, was not the sort of the the horror struck kind of disaster um, that that the communist propaganda always said it was, and which I think was very effective globally in in us sort of believing that too. I mean, it was actually quite, it was obviously a very mixed place with many poor people, but it was also a world, a a place that was open to the world. It had a lot of good things going on. It had education, it had healthcare, it had amazing cultural um, activity, um, all of which, you know, the cultural stuff pretty much died after the communists came. So you know, the pre-1949 Republican China was actually a very interesting place. And it's been quite popular in China in recent years among middle classes to examine that more carefully and to look at what was good. And, you know, you mentioned the United Nations. Well, of course, the UN's Declaration of Universal of Universal Declaration of Human Rights was co-written by a Chinese person. Of course, yeah. Right? who then yeah. um, was, but wasn't a communist. He was a nationalist. He was with the KMT, the Kuomintang, that was Chiang Kai-shek's crowd. And he then left for um, for Taiwan. And, um, you know, so he was from the so-called other side. Yeah, not, they they lost the civil war in China. Um, but that, that, and he didn't just like the, co-sign the, the white, it. The white Chinese, right? <laughs> well, yeah, you could say the, the traditional yeah. ones, the ones who really yeah. worried that communism was going to be bad for the country. Right. And, and, um, you know, he didn't just sign this piece of paper, he also co-wrote it. And there are concepts, universalist concepts in there, which which are, um, you know, which which are Chinese, if you like. So it, this, this isn't a superficial thing, this is a significant thing. And, and what's so interesting is that the Communist Party, of course, completely rejects the notion of universal human rights to this day, despite that. They don't want to be tied to that. And I'll say also, like with the threats to invade Taiwan, which are constant and growing, um, I think that the CCP, the Communist Party, is essentially, you know, wants to restart the Chinese Civil War. This is very yeah, worrying. I, I think. I think. Like, you know? uh, let me let me let me just hold, um, yeah. you know, uh, the, uh, the interject here. Yeah. You you talk about China, 
Start, starting from a very low economic and institutional base in so far as it's a political economy uh, to foster you know wealth and uh, you know spread it across the um, vast uh, population but i think you know from 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 where i where i sit i see china as um, um, a semi frankenstein um, that the west has created right i mean like you talk about infusion of capital uh, the business model technology, three things, right? I mean, mm -hmm. You look at technology as a, as a focus of your specialization. Um, the, the, you know, from, uh, mm -hmm. uh, from the late 1970s when uh, Deng Xiaoping came to power, you know, his idea was uh, the, this slogan, you know, the, you know, it doesn't matter what color of the cat, yeah. Uh, you know, it needs to catch a mice, right? Yeah, uh, a mouse, right? And uh, and so I think the um, the uh, the West is looking China now as this, uh, you know, essentially, uh, you know, the most threatening villain, uh, you know, against the um, the rule based order, mm -hmm. you know, pro human rights and world order. But it has massively contributed to the rise of China. You know, it has ended. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we we I mean, the international order, the WTO, the global capitalist system has massively strengthened the Communist Party. So, I mean, that, that's a major, major paradox. You know, it is and yeah. And the, the the Communist CCP, you know basically mm. leached on the capitalist world order it ideologically attacked. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, it it ideologically attacks it, but really only in the sense that it needs ideology in order to justify its own complete power at home, its own, its own monopoly on power. So this is a story it tells its own people and the world is that we are this ideological creature. But in a sense, a lot of these ideologies are merely, um, you know, a lot of the doctrine that is espoused in China to this day, even with including with Xi Jinping, are ways of justifying the exercise of um, a dictatorship, the justifying the exercise of complete control and monopoly on power at home. Because you always need a story, right? You, yes. you, need, you need legitimacy, you need a story. To, to, to justify you being in power in the first place and your continued power as well. You need to constantly do this. And China, the Communist Party understands that extremely well. So it's not really in terms of, um, you know, it's, 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 this isn't an ideological battle in the sense that it was in the Cold War with the sort of ideas, different actual different models necessarily, although in China, it's a very, very statist model has grown up. But again, look, you know, look back to the tradition. I mean, part of the reason why China has been so successful, the Communist Party ruled China has been so successful at creating wealth at home, is because China has such a powerful tradition of, 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 um, you know, of, of education, of discipline, you know, through the Confucian system, um, very ta highly talented people, this work ethic, you know, these things are real. Um, they're not just a cliche, or they're sometimes used as a cliche, but they are actually also real. And if you look at any Chinese society in the world, look at Taiwan. Taiwan has made an enormous success of itself, but it hasn't just it just hasn't done the communist thing, right? It's much more liberal. Um, Hong Kong was was an extraordinary and still is an extraordinary place. Um, look at other Confucian societies. Look at Japan. Look at South Korea. They didn't go the communist road, um, but they they did. Um, have flourished enormously. There's just something about the power and that cultural strength. And, and that right. has, you know, and then people say, ah, oh, but look, you know, the Communist Party has achieved so much. I can pretty much guarantee you that if the party hadn't come, China would also be wealthy and powerful today if it yeah. had a different system, like the Taiwanese system, right. if they'd I mean, actually like, won the civil war. Same thing. Yeah, I mean, like the, the, you know, the obviously, um, you know, deep cultural traditions, you know, focus on learning, uh, hard work, um, you know, the uh, cohesion within family, uh, com com family community. As, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and obviously they, the, the Chinese communist strategist, um, you know, today very clearly understand the importance of culture and, and yeah. uh, you know, yeah. cultural practices like, uh, you know, social thought. 
And uh, are they trying to use other people's cultures to, to uh, you know, to turn uh, basically foreign societies uh, yeah. th- th- to do their bidding? You know, that th- it seems that you uh, directly name and you know uh, identified uh, institutions and individuals. For instance, in the United States, like you know, Ivy League universities, think tanks, right? And uh, you identified um, in your research, uh, you know, that you published in the new- Newsweek in, uh, I believe, uh, October 2020, last year. Yes. Um, the, about 600 major institutions that the Chinese Communist Party attempted to instrumentalize mm. uh, against the American interest. Can you explain yeah, you know, the, so, the, the, the mo- modus operandi Yeah, of so, China? so this all connects to China's, the Communist Party's concept of overseas Chinese. So basically, after they finished persecuting them, um, you know, ones who returned to China after the revolution, and after Mao's death in 1976, China, the Communist Party understood that they had to change to survive in power. The first 30 years were a disaster, um, by by and large. Um, so they developed this sort of more open, outwardly looking, more kind of um, this concept of taking advantage of this big overseas Chinese population, whom they then came up with very emotional language to describe. They realized that their overseas Chinese were a huge asset to the country, to the party. And they tr- started to call them... Um, rather than punish them for being non-communist Chinese. So there you see the ideology dropping. They started to call them um, which means overseas pure red hearts, essentially, yeah? And they began to, to play the ethnic card, play the nationalist card and say, if you are, you know, you are Chinese, you must be loyal to the motherland. You must serve the motherland. And, you know, it could be anywhere. It could be Indonesia. It could be Singapore. It could be Burma. It could be America. It could be Australia. And it was everywhere. Um, and these people then increasingly were um, found themselves being approached by um, the elements of the Communist Party's system state um, and um, co-opted to serve the motherland, yeah, this was the language, highly emotionalized. Um, and what, what then began to happen was that previous overseas Chinese organizations that may have been independent, that may have been like 100, 150 years old, even in some places, were increasingly sort of uh, taken over by the communist um, power structure and system through certain individuals, and um, they try to win everyone over. And um, that has functioned extremely successfully. It's at home, it was always the United Front, yeah, the Tongzhan in China. The United Front's role was always to co-opt all non-communists for the communist cause, to, to separate friends from enemies. This is where you see the Leninism coming in. Are you a friend? Are you critical? But they think they can win you over to support communism or the Communist Party more like, um, in which case they will work on you, offer you jobs opportunities, offer you a community, offer you all kinds of advantages. Um, um, If you're considered too extreme, like an enemy, well, then they will isolate you and try and destroy you. And that's how the United Front works. Lenin set it up in Moscow. Uh, It was first practiced through here in Germany, where I am in Berlin in the 1920s. That's the United Front. It's an Brilliant and rather evil concept, in my opinion. So then, to get back to the to get back to the issue of um, to get back to the issue of this connection, I think between contemporary modern power in China and civilizational strengths. So you then see when you start to read, you see this United Front concept, communist concept, working around the world, working at home, um, and you see the 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 people who who are like at the Central Academy of Socialism, who are paid to sort of think and write and talk about this and convince people, um, they're starting to link it to the Chinese traditional power concept of tianxia, which means, you know, everything under heaven is controlled by the emperor, yeah? And then they actually, you actually read things where it says, we must sinify the United Front and um, connect it to our traditional cultural concept of tianxia, which is really imperial power. And there you start to see a really interesting, troubling, I think, hybrid um, of culture and and communist power, Leninism, if you like, 
at work yeah. in the world. I mean, yeah. like, as, as a side joke, um, because uh, you mentioned Lenin and how he set it up. Uh, the the yeah. first experimental group was in, in Berlin, right? But but he was also held by the uh, uh, by the German ruling elite at the time, um, you know, on the eve of the revolution yes, to, to pass through Germany, right? From Switzerland, where he Absolutely. was exiled for, for over a decade or two decades. So that they he could lead the communist revolution and smash the you know Germans arch enemy um, the czarist regime right absolutely and it, it came back to roost, it's such right? a crazy story because he was actually put in a sealed train yeah and yeah yeah it's, just, it's just so the he could be back in so the German rulers then as you say these sort of reactionary kind of in a way guys they they understood the so called contagion. Of, right. of these Leninist ideas and literally put him in a sealed train to pass through German territory, unable to connect to his environment in Germany. It's extraordinary, really. Yeah, yeah. Up through Finland and then into Russia to, to bring down, you know, to bring revolution there. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's politics you know people are pretty evil <laughs> well well the, the, the same the same the same thing with yeah. the united states right mm. i mean because the, the u.s considered during the cold war the um the soviet russia the arch enemy right mm -hmm. and so there were two communist giants um the one russia and of uh, sorry soviet union and then one maoist china right yes and so the uh, when there was um uh, the, a wedge uh, that began to appear between these two communist giants that, you know, uh, Kissinger and Nixon thought they were very smart yeah. Yeah. To, to go to, um, uh, to left um, Mao, right? And then I brought, brought them um, the, to, to play uh, table tennis in, in, in Washington, D.C., ping pong diplomacy, if you remember. Yeah. And, uh, the, you know, the, there was this uh, hotel um, uh, in, in on Connecticut Avenue, like uh, the uh, Mayflower Hotel, okay, yeah, uh, where the uh, the the Chinese uh, delegation stayed uh, when they were working out arrangement how to undermine basically Soviet Russia to get right. <laughs> yeah. And so now, like, look, I mean, now like the U.S. is up in arm, like openly, basically, you know, yeah, short of declaring a war, the United States has uh, made it intention very clear that it doesn't want China's rice uh, going in this what you consider bullying, aggressive, essentially expansionist uh, direction, right? And so, but the, can, can you can you talk about, um, you know, how CCP uses not, you know, only the, um, you know, Chinese or people of Chinese ancestry, Han, Han mm -hmm. ancestry, I should add, yes. uh, the, as the proxies or like, you know, instruments of Chinese Communist Party interests around the world, including United Kingdom, Germany. Yeah. Um, can you talk about how CCP uses, you know, German institutions, for instance, right? Or um, the US institutions, uh, universities, think tanks, companies, businesses, right? Mm. Uh, to serve the Chinese Communist Party's interest. And then yeah. of course, like, we need to make a distinction between uh, China as a, a community, national community of people, and the Communist Party, right? Because we cannot degenerate our, dis, you know, uh, into uh, China bashing or Chinese no, people no. bashing, right? Well, I mean, of course not, and and, and that's the last thing that anybody um, who's a serious um, critical analyst of of the Communist Party system wants to do. I mean, you know, that's. Um, Nobody wants that. It's uh, and at the same time, you know, it's a tool that the party often uses accusations of racism to manipulate um, arguments and try to destroy um, or undermine um, people who do analyze the Communist Party and what it does, um, because they know that, that that's a powerful tool at their disposal is to stir racial hatred. We saw this in the US um, where they uh, propaganda disinformation from China was supporting both the Black Lives Matter movement and the Blue Lives Matter, so the police, right? They were just basically setting people against each other. Um, and that's been documented. So, um, I mean, it's very easy for a Communist Party really to, to penetrate a um, open society because open societies are by definition open. You know, we, we in, in, in Western democracies and in other democracies, we've, we, we believe in issues like open research, like that research will advance the good of all 
humanity, yeah? So, so our research, our basic research is open to the world. Um, it's published in, in academic journals that can be read by anyone. The idea is the greater good of humanity. Now, um, it's very easy to get in there and to say, aha, so this basic research can achieve this. And if I can bring this research back to China, and use it for military purposes, which is what happens because of course, China operates a system, the communist party operates a system of military civil fusion. You literally cannot distinguish between any object in China, whether it would be for military or civil use because everything by definition has a dual function. Right. This is a huge problem. Yeah, right, right. In, in collaboration and in academic collaboration. Um, and I literally don't know anyone who has a good solution to it yet. Perhaps there's some interesting ideas growing in Japan now, um, how to deal with some of these. And I think that they're ahead of the world, even ahead of the US. But you know, how do they how do they do this? Well, they China is incredibly good, has really, it's so fascinating how the Communist Party has understood the power of stories. Um, and and how, how are we supposed to understand that? It's like they've sort of decided that um, capturing the narrative, you know, all these sort of words that you normally find in an English literature, you know, undergraduate degree, critical theory, critical thinking, yeah? I mean, it's Marxist in a sense, in, in some ways. Um, the power of narrative, discourse control, this Gramscian sort of um, Marxist analysis. The party has been very clever and has harnessed this Xi Jinping has been talking about it for years now. Uh, tell the China story well. So what you need to do is you need to win hearts and minds. You need to gain narrative high ground. And they do this really everywhere in a very disciplined fashion. Uh, you see diplomats doing it. You see Chinese student and scholar associations furthering this discourse. You see them reaching out to civil society in Germany, for example, um, via, for example, uh, 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 the Chinese People's Association for, um, you know, for friendship um, in Beijing, headquartered in Beijing, and telling, you know, telling the Chinese story well, staying on message. And this is ideological in this, in a sense, um, but it's also orient, It's also about gaining influence and gaining power, gaining business, offering opportunity to people, and through this, you know, control through support, which is what they've done in Tibet for a long time as well. For example, control through support. You seem to support religion. You may build a monastery, and then you control it through by appointing the the, the correct monks and not the monks who are going to give you trouble. Yes, yeah, so you see a lot of this control through support, and I think these same tactics are at work everywhere in the world uh, the, you know the um, you mentioned about the uh, uh, open research uh, you know the peer reviewed of scientific and otherwise uh, the in in western um, you know the, the liberal countries where like you know the universities are thriving and uh, you know the, the attract hundreds yeah. of millions of students around the world right uh, over generations uh, but I think like there, there is something um, you know that needs to be mentioned here. That that is the um, you know uh, government funding from mm -hmm. fu uh, basic research uh, has been drastically reduced. Uh, yes, you know, uh, in the United States yes. and, 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 and particularly in the UK, right? Universities are forced to seek um, foreign uh, you know tuition money by the billions of dollars, yes. right? And also academics are forced to find. Uh, their own grant money, you know, the, you 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 simply uh, they cannot afford to focus on research and intellectual output, but you have to bring in money, right? Yeah. So so when institutions such as like Cambridge or Oxford or like Imperial College or SOAS are forced to find uh, money to to continue uh, running these research programs, and and the easy money comes from Beijing. Yeah, Beijing linked um, yeah. institutions, right? Yeah. Then, like with money comes the uh, influence. I mean, of like uh, recently, you know, the um, the Cambridge University Press. I mean, one of the most uh, prestigious and influential in the world, uh, uh, that got in a hot seat because uh, you know they, they took money from um, you know Chinese entities, and those uh, entities attempt to uh, the, uh, you know get involved with the selection process for uh, manuscripts, right? Of course, and, yeah. And, and that goes against the ethos of uh, independent, uh, you know, autonomous and um, academic institutions, right? Can, can you talk about how China uses uh, its massive disposable trillions uh, yeah. to, to, to basically buy and yeah. shape uh, top 
institution yeah. that produce a global elite. Yeah. I mean, look, we've been living for, what, 30 years or so in a very um, <clears throat> some neoliberal world where uh, this business mentality has grown that business knows best how to run a university, for example. I think this is obviously complete nonsense, if I may say so. <laughs> um, you know, you need to run a university according to real academic and intellectual uh, criteria. And it, it's, you know, it, it's a phase that I think we're, we're, we're starting to come out of because of precisely the, the obvious risk of having money from a place like China or from, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia or other countries. Right. Um, yeah, there's many, many places uh, where this is happening um, and how they can buy influence. So in the US um, last year, the uh, Department of Education uh, did a, began to force universities to disclose their overseas funding and how this was in many ways corrupting um, processes, corrupting studies, um, outcomes. Um, and they found it very difficult to get universities to actually come clean about their finances. This is a huge problem, not just in the US, but in the UK as well, everywhere in the world, in fact. And it's, it's very ironic to me that... Um, this is one of my favorite concerns with, with the CCP is that the left wing in the UK, in the US, doesn't pay enough attention to the, to the um, risks to democracy from a, a one party state like the Communist Party, because you would think that they would say, well, this isn't very fair. This is a this neoliberal agenda is a source of massive and in growing inequality. We have in, we have financial elites, you know, we have the, the burgeoning of, of all kinds of international life, which very few people can afford. They're running the world, et cetera, which is true, a Davos man, et cetera, right? And yet they're not saying, well, look how China is taking part of that. And they're not examining China's role in pushing this um, sort of very, um, you know, growing inequality in the world. China has one of the highest domestic inequality ratios, Gini coefficient in the planet, on the planet, yeah? But they're not looking at China critically. And this is very frustrating because then you end up, when you do look at China objectively, neutrally, and just analyze what's going on, you end up um, finding it very hard to find people on the so-called left um, in, in democratic countries who want to join you, yeah? So you end up with people who are maybe more right-wing than you would normally think would be your kind of gut people. And, and this is a very widespread problem, is that somehow uh, left, left-wing people in, you know, in, in democracies don't really seem to understand that China is driving, I mean, the whole globalization process, cheap labor, cheap goods, but China is driving this, yeah? The so-called Communist Party is driving this. And we, I think we really need to build up a much more robust um, critical left um, in, in democracies, you know, when it comes to dealing with China. And that would be my, my one big wish. But, but to get back to the... Um, academic thing just really briefly we did we did we did this um we did this book um china's quest for foreign technology beyond espionage and i think that the you know the um this is that from a routledge yeah it is a routledge and it's right. co-authored with some wonderful wonderful people um and you know this really the 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 the, the um, magnifying glass really says it all you take a magnifying glass to what's actually happening you know since 1978 china um has sent um, six million students abroad to study in the so-called West and in Japan and in South Korea, uh, to study in democracies and in advanced industrialized nations, if you like. Um, about, just some figures, about 4.3 million have finished their studies currently, and um, about 3.6 or 7 million have gone back to China. Now they've taken with them all that knowledge and we identified 32 methods whereby technology is being transferred from the industrialized nations and back to China and has this process is decades old at this point. Um, there are 32 methods of which 12 are legal, legal, um, such as legally agreed contracts, um, 12 are um, gray zone where we can't know what's happening because China is so close to the outside world. Like we, very, we, we very can, opaque, yeah? very closed structures. We simply don't have reciprocity. Yeah. China can come here and do whatever it wants. Pretty much. We can't go there and do whatever we want. I was in China as a journalist for 14 years and hardly ever, 
ever had interviews with government officials. One time, a friend of mine who was a feminist tried to get me to the Chinese U Women's University to take part in an internal meeting. I wasn't allowed in because I was a foreigner. And this was a party meeting and I just couldn't even get in, you know. So we are so shut out of that system. Um, it's a very, very unequal relationship, I would say. Um, but of then you've got, so to get back to the, the technology extraction issue, which has fueled China's rise, um, very targeted, very deliberate, sort of um, the Ministry of Science and Technology, Education, the Public Security Ministry, um, basically telling people what they need in China. They identify weaknesses, people go out, they get them. So 12 methods are legal, 12 illegal, uh, excuse me, eight illegal and 12 gray zone. And there you have it, 32 ways that we identified how this process is happening. And what's extraordinary really is that practically nobody, I mean, I could almost count on the fingers of two hands, how many people outside of China actually understand the system. And it's vast. We, but there's so much we don't know about China. We so have real so, knowledge problems. So you, you, you are talking, I mean, like you're talking about, um, you know, quite a few million Chinese overseas students in top and other universities in uh, industrialized economies that have been turned into essentially um, the, te uh, the technological um, agents of the Chinese state. You Earlier you mentioned about, you know, the technology, not simply, I mean, like we look at technology as like, you know, social media platform, like, you know, uh, the tools for uh, internet businesses, you know, uh, the whatever. Um, but but you, you are saying that technology from the perspective of CCP is a tool for state building. Can you yes. explain on that? Because yeah, well, get... yeah. I mean, and this is where it gets really tricky and we have to be so careful um, to reject all racist and all um, discriminatory um, ways of thinking and outcomes, but for sure, um, many of these students have been under continuous pressure, and we can prove that. You know, we have the texts, we have the policies, we, we have the party statements um, to serve the motherland, to bring back technology, to serve the motherland while stay, remaining overseas. It's called a stay in place policy. You can stay in America and you can still send the ideas and the, 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 the details and the technology back home. Yeah, to build up the, the um, the Chinese state, which wants to re lead the world by 2035 in, in many major areas, the business of technology. Um, I'll just give you an example of some of the technology that China feels it needs and which it tasks some of these students with getting. Now, not all. Um, and, you know, I would prefer maybe to call them some of them condits you know, conduits of yeah. this sort of transfer rather than agents. I, I understand, and some of them are agents, but I just, I just have a, obviously have a horror of going anywhere near anything that, that could get innocent people into trouble. And we have to be so careful about this and we have to remain fair, remain, you know, remain balanced. Um, but let me just literally read out to you a couple of the titles of technology bases that have been set up in China by the government and which are then supposed to be fed by overseas, whether Chinese students or also some foreign students. So we've got something called a um, millimeter wave terahertz detection imaging technology innovation and talent introduction base in Harbin in the Northeast. We've got something called a complex environmental photoelectric information sensory science and technology innovation and talent introduction base um, in, in, in Xi'an, yeah? So you, you've got these really scientifically complex um, organizations within China, bases as they call them, which is of course military terminology as well, GD, yeah? It's a military thinking. This is a communist came out, came out of the army, right? Uh, and out of revolution. Um, and that thinking is still very, very powerful and it's how things are organized. Um, and, and then people overseas are supposed to, if they ha happen to have, a, if they're studying or they're sent overseas to gain a knowledge in aviation aerospace, yeah? Or advanced ceramics, composites and coatings, innovation, and talent base, yeah? And then you, you, you send people overseas and then they come back and they, they share everything. And at the same time, you have this enormous system within China, a library, uh, digital, paper, everything. Um, 
one in the civilian section, one in the military uh, system, yeah, um, scouring the PhDs of the world, scouring journals, um, business um, brochures, just everything to identify what China needs, and then through people, and then they come back and they begin to build their military industrial complex, and also their business and what it's a brilliant system and china is very very good at um commercializing knowledge yeah so we tend to like in, in democracies you tend to produce knowledge you believe in knowledge for knowledge's sake you produce knowledge you do the research you're very free very innovative you pay a high price politically for it because democracies are very messy they're argumentative they have lots of problems they're all exposed and that's not the case in china where it's very controlled you know the invention information environment is incredibly controlled um and, um, you know, but we don't necessarily commercialize our inventions. Yeah. China is very good at commercializing. Yeah. But I, th I, th I have to uh, disagree with you here because, uh, you know, the, um, the university research agendas are set by um, uh, the interest of the corporate, um, you know, uh, 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 corporate um, entities like, you know, the, in the, in the, the uh, and anything that produces uh, or that leads to commercialization or, pro, you know, profitization of research uh, that always attract a massive quantity of uh, outside industry funding, right? No, no, that, that's, so, that's so, definitely so it, part it, of it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, like, you know, yeah. Uh, you know, like science, science and technology, you know, like uh, the emphasis mm. on science and technology and shutting down the humanities departments uh, in, in the mm -hmm. U.S., for instance, right? That's part of it. And so, but the... Uh, what what, what would be helpful is like uh, to, to you know like to, 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 to perhaps like to explain um, the role of Huawei. You know, mm -hmm. Huawei was set up by uh, you know a, a veteran of the Red Army, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, his daughter recently was released back to uh, the China from Canada, mm -hmm. where she was put under house arrest at the behest of the uh, the American authorities, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, recently, the um, the Washington Post sent an article about, mm. uh, you know, the, the Huawei's role. And uh, the, can, can you talk about, you know, as an example of uh, uh, a case where Chinese corporations are, you know, basically in, in tight um, alliance or mm. symbiosis with the communist party? Mm. Well, they have to be, you know. I mean, Huawei is a very well-known example, and it's an important one because it's such a large company and it's operating in such a sensitive area. Um, digital, right? And um, no, but, 5G recently, right? Yeah, right, exactly. Um, so, but Chinese companies by law um, have to cooperate with the security services. So the um, national security law Article number seven, I believe it is, states very clearly that all Chinese citizens, so PRC citizens and companies, um, they call it units, sort of Danwei or Shiye, um, but it essentially means anything really from a company to a civil society organization and individuals um, must by law uh, support, assist and cooperate with national security um, demands yeah so this means that even by chinese law it's clear that even if a company that like huawei says that they are not carrying out orders for the um mss the ministry of state security or for the communist party that's simply impossible because they they would be breaking their own chinese law if they were to refuse and the same law also says that not only do they have to cooperate with state security they also have to keep it hidden that they are doing so. So if Huawei says, no, we don't cooperate with state security, all you can know from that is that they are, in fact, also following Chinese law by denying it. So they right, have right. to deny it. This is in Article 7. Mm. So this is just the most fundamental point that we have to understand about China and how it's set up and its companies. They cannot not obey the party, its law. So, you know, um, that's are you saying that? Are you saying problem. that no, no economic or you know uh, the academic institutions can say no to CCP? In other words, there there is Correct. no such thing as, as I am uh, saying that yeah a, 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 autonomy of uh, 
uh, organizations and communities, right? Because if you look at, the, say, like the uh, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, right? And uh, these these are the people that would tell the um, uh, the Communist Party's uh, uh, tales around the world, like you yeah. know, they infuse these tales in their analyses, right? Right. And uh, they uh, they become, in effect, an arm of the uh, CCP's propaganda yeah. of, uh, industry, if you yeah. will. But but now you're Absolutely. saying that economic economic institutions, a business organizations run and owned by Chinese citizens and nationals, right? Uh, that that uh, either as individuals or as business organizations cannot say no to this Article Seven of uh, legally no, they cannot. They cannot. They would be breaking Chinese law. They would be exposing themselves to terrible risk. Now. Um, this is both in China and overseas, and this applies to both state-owned companies and to so-called private companies, because um, we have mm, so many examples of speeches, of policies, of, I mean, of texts of all kinds, party edicts, where um, private businesses are also required to um, work with the United Front in order to marshal all support for the Communist Party. Um, again, you have the politics just everywhere. Now, this, this doesn't, so there is no meaningful distinction in many ways between an SOE and a so-called private company, yeah? So that's an important point to keep in mind, although the, 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 the channels of communication may be different. Um, but look, there are many Chinese business people who wish dearly it would be differently. And I, I think that some people um, try to behave differently, but you know, it's, they're always on thin ice, if you like, because this is, this is the fundamental structure of the country. And this is what we really have to understand. Yeah. We, we tend to do a lot of mirroring. Yeah. We see, we say, right. right. We mirror a lot. Everyone's a human being and, you know, Western liberalism is all about, you know, acknowledging the similarities between people, despite their, you know, ethnic background or I don't know, class and everything. We're all human beings. And, and this is this is true. But it the result of this attitude is, of course, that we tend to look at people who may be working or living under very, very different direct political conditions, which force them to behave in certain ways. And we disregard the constraints on their behavior. We disregard what it is they have to do. We just say, oh, look, there's a human brain person they a human being they live and they breathe just as I do they must be the same this is mirroring and it's very inappropriate really when you're dealing with a Leninist system which is so explicitly politically um you know worked out and organized so many good people many good individuals they can't do anything about their situation either yeah so we we do need to look at this structurally we need to look at this politically yeah but I I do I do want to like come in and uh, mm -hmm. the rescue um, the names uh, either Lenin or Gramsci because we both mentioned uh, the, these names uh, right because uh, they're both um, you know uh, Lenin and Gramsci operated in a radically vastly uh, different context uh, for a, a, a different purpose right for them you know the uh, either Gramscian analyses of cultures or uh, civil society or you know Lenin's um, uh, push for revolutionary organization they were operating within the context of a very, very repressive, uh, you know, uh, the the uh, the feudal and even like you know the uh, the, uh, the neo-fascist or fascist um, uh, sit, uh, the states. You see what I mean? So 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 Gramsci was pushing uh, the uh, you know uh, the spreading his analyses, um, you know, through prison notebooks and writings. Yeah, sure. Uh, on the side of the vast majority of people. But we, we are talking about the Chinese communist state, uh, you know, the, the second largest and uh, no, the second or wealthiest in the world. Uh, that is using these Leninist models and Grumgian ideas of discourse and, you know, uh, whatnot uh, to strengthen the repressive CCP against a vast majority of of Chinese citizens at home, yeah, uh, and um, you know, uh, the, the projecting its colonial ambitions abroad. Because every time you, you know, anyone mentions that our country must shape the world, that's like straight mm -hmm. out of 
uh, the British colonialism, right? Mm -hmm. Because they wanted to shape the destiny of the world in the way it suited and advanced their economic and imperial interests, right? So, so China, you know, earlier we talked about the Chinese communist uh, elite, a ruling elite, mm. and their self-perception, their role, you know, their, the, uh, they, their view about the role and the place of China uh, mm. in the new world order they are trying to usher in, uh, you know, against the uh, existing um, the US interest and whatnot. Mm. And mm. so, so I think like we, we need to make a distinction. You know, I'm not being doctrinal. I'm, I'm just saying that uh, they're using concepts and ideas that were meant to be for emancipation of the oppressed, but, but use them in ways that strengthen the repressive Chinese Communist Party. Uh, well, the revolution always eats its children, famously. Yes, uh, yes absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, so uh, the, the, uh, you know, like on, on the subject of China's repression, uh, do, do you see the um, of China's domestic behavior, the way it treats its citizens and nationality groups, including, say, Tibetans and Uyghurs, and, uh, you know, we can never not talk about Tibetan and, and Uyghurs, uh, you know, because it will be just simply immoral and intellectually dishonest to leave these communities, you know, that are, have been subject to either direct colon, col uh, colonization or uh, genocidal policies by CCP. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so do you see the domestic behavior of the CCP and its, you know, uh, external behavior around the world? Uh, the the interlocking or are they two separate entities? No, they're very interlocked, I think. And um, that's because, you know, there's this sort of almost joke, you know, I mean, the Americans say making the world safe for democracy and uh, that the, the Chinese version would be making this world safe for autocracy. Yeah, so the or authoritarianism or making the world safe for totalitarianism, if you like, at you know, which is what they have at home. And I think to use the totalitarianism word is is once again appropriate because of the level of technological control and surveillance that they have. You know, um, you know, I mean, you can be tracked through a city, and they will they won't just track your face; they will track how you walk. They will track how your arms move when you walk, and this will be logged. Yeah, and you can, it's, it's extraordinary what's happening now. And we've seen um, Huawei's big involvement in that in the Washington Post story you mentioned, which is really important. But I think um, the whole issue of repression at home is very complicated because there are certainly many Chinese people who um, will take the view that first of all, they're economically better off than they were before. And secondly, um, you know, everything is relative anyway. So if I'm better off today than I was 10 years ago, then the government is good. Yeah. So I, I'm not saying that um, everyone in China is, you know, suffering and miserable. That is absolutely not the case. There are many people who are benefiting very highly from this system. And part of the reason for that, of course, is that the Communist Party has understood that in order to win support, you need to reward people. So it rewards people. So they have a lot invested in the system. That's part of it. But what you see, and it's so interesting, is that what the party actually does is that it, it attacks people who think differently from itself. This is it has to um, challenge values and ideologies and yeah, values and, and thought systems that are different from its own because they are incredibly threatening to the party. This is why we see the long ongoing attack on Tibetans. Yeah, they have a different religion. They have a different society. We see now a, an ongoing attack on the Uyghurs. They too have a different religion. It's not a coincidence that it's the thought, the religion, the, what's in the head, the belief, the heart, that is that attracts the, the violence um, of the party. Yeah, because these, these different thought systems are incredibly, incredibly dangerous for its control at home. Um, and we see the same with um, with uh, democracy activists or lawyers who will who believe in a different a, a different way of being in the world of of living different value system. They've also been attacked in China. Uh, the lawyers were pretty much shut down. Yeah. So so you know, and democracy protests all the time. Um, and, and in Hong Kong, it's the same. A different 
political system, different values, different understanding of what, what it means to be a person and what is the relationship between the individual and power. And does the individual ultimately actually have an absolute right to defend themselves from power? And this, again, immensely challenging, threatening to the party. Why? Because only the party has absolute rights in China. And there, so this is a kind of a, a sort of a capacity for violence, which I see is almost like a kind of a roaming force and it can hit anywhere at any time. Uyghurs, Muslims, um, I mean, excuse me, Tibet, Uyghurs, Tibetans, Hong Kongers, Taiwanese dissidents, Christians in China, um, lawyers, this kind of thing. And, and I think that um, we need to be prepared for the idea that this kind of thinking and approach to power and control um, is increasingly coming at us as well. Um, and I can give you a very, very brief but concrete example. Um, on the first anniversary of the death of Liu Xiaobo, the Nobel Peace Prize winner who died in custody in prison, uh, in a hospital prison in China in uh, July 2017. On the first anniversary of his death, I was in Berlin 2018 in July. His wife, uh, Liu Xia, had just been released. The Germans had gotten her out. And there was an event in a church here um, uh, to commemorate the first anniversary of his death. And there were um, security agents. Chinese security agents were in the church in Germany, this church had been very important in the fall of the East German government in the Christian dissident movement against the communism in East Germany, very, very symbolic church called the Getsemane, the Getsemane church. Um, they were in there and Chinese people who had come to honor Liu Xiaobo's life were leaving because they were afraid of being filmed, identified, photographed by these agents in the church. So that, that's an example of transnational repression. And what were the Chinese doing? The, the Chinese agents, they were um, targeting, you know, people who had come to honor the life of a very, very major democracy thinker, democratic thinker in China, an indigenous Chinese person, right, who's, who always lived in China, who wasn't an overseas person. And they were doing it overseas. So there you see the problem and how these two do blend, they do merge, and how I think we actually really need to watch out for this problem in future. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, you know, when a political system cannot uh, handle, um, uh, not simply like a to not tolerate, but, you know, actively seek out to crush any, uh, you know, the plurality of thoughts and ideas, right? right. Then like a, the, you, you, we are entering into the space of like a totalitarianism. Yeah, that, exactly. That's what happened in Nazi Germany. Yeah. That's what happened in Soviet Ideology. Union, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Like, you know, there's, so there's only one type of thinking and the correct thinking, right? Exactly. Cor and then correct with correct thinking, like you, you've got correct the feelings towards the state and the party. You right? must feel the, correctly. The party becomes yes. the... Uh, um, omnipresent and omnipotent uh, entity, right? Uh, so it's like this scaringly godlike institution that decides, you know, during the, uh, at the height of the, co um, the uh, communist times in uh, Soviet Russia and Eastern Bloc, uh, the party was playing the role of the god, you know, like uh, de yeah. deciding, you know, like uh, the, the marriage and everything, right? Um, so the, but you're talking about like the Chinese state and, and its its security agents around the world uh, intimidating, harassing, or even perhaps like quietly, forcibly despairing certain mm -hmm. uh, the Chinese nationals that oh, they yeah. deemed uh, uh, enemies of the state quietly. But what about its economic, um, you know, uh, punitive measures that it often mm. uh, engages in? Say, for instance, you talk about the Chinese... Um, Nobel laureate who passed away, mm -hmm. and I believe like his ashes were thrown off Yangtze River or somewhere, right? In the ocean, and, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I was recently in Oslo talking to uh, a couple of mm -hmm. like uh, the um, Norwegian diplomats. One happened to be based in Beijing at the time of the the, the Nobel Award, right. and he was saying that the Chinese uh, Communist Party could not simply understand that the Nobel Committee in Oslo might have some autonomy vis-a-vis -vis yeah. the Norwegian state, right? And and um, and so because like the, the Chinese communists were mirroring, as you said, mm. they see a foreign yeah. entity, you say like, okay, well, these are also controlled by Norwegian government and parliament. Therefore, yeah. the, the, you know, the, the, the entire country has to be 
boycotted it. So they stopped importing salmon, right? You know, yeah. Norway is like a leading uh, in- exporter of salmon, right? For 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 years, like you know, the 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 diplomatic ties were rather frozen, right? And then like it, it the, the Chinese openly attacked Australia. You yeah. Know, I mean, I mean, in CCP now, like recently, there was a de- announcement by. Um, of the uh, U.S., U.K., and Canada, of the, maybe Australia as well, uh, the, the the intent to boycott um, the mm. Winter Olympic yeah. diplomatic boycott, yeah, yeah, and then, mm. then like the the, the uh, CCP spokesperson hit back and you will face severe consequences. Mm. I mean, like, you you know you know like they talk to the world as if we were you know school children yeah. and they were the. Uh, you know, yep. tough-minded um, headmasters. You yeah. Know. Can you talk about how the Chinese Communist Party uses, um, you know, this kind of punitive discourse to go after, you know, even like some of the most powerful states in the world? Like yeah. USA. Well, as you say, it's, it's they're mirroring their own understanding of um, power and of relations. And they, um, in a way, they are, um, also, I think, however, um, sending a signal to democratic countries that that um, the power holders who are elected um, should be more like them. So if you can't control your um, your people, if you can't control your um, Nobel Prize winning choosing board, well, then you should. So this is also quite subversive, obviously, because they're basically saying, you know, you need to change. And um, so it's not very respectful of other systems. Um, Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, the thing with the salmon, of course, it was and this is also very um, typical of China, I think, was that uh, even though direct imports were were very affected, um, the the, the fish and other things kept coming in through other places like via Vietnam, for example. Yeah. So there was a workaround. And, And there's there's this very strong tradition in China as well of this this, you know, awful constant control, like, you know, just never giving up the control from above and then the pushback from below. And there's this Chinese saying that reflects that very well. It says, you know, the, the upper, the, the higher levels have their, have their orders and the lower levels have their pushback is essentially what it, and, and, and that's, that's a, obviously a response to, to tyranny anywhere or to, 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 you know, despotism or imperial systems anywhere is that the, the common people have to resist. They have to have their ways of, of, of resisting. Yeah. They have to have their resilience. Um, so I think, you know, that that's really all just to, to, to say that we do, um, we do need to watch out for how China is trying to push its own system. And, and this is also why, you know, I, uh, you know, I myself came from a very kind of left-wing family background. Um, my father's a university professor, uh, kind of a Marxist intellectual. Uh, we grew up, you know, um, in a colony, a British colony as anti-colonials. Yeah, this is very definite. Um, and um, in addition, I mean, I'm I, I'm an Irish citizen. My father's an Irish citizen. He he was, you know, this is a, a very old colonial relationship. He was not, you know, not unaware. But but I think um, you know, and social justice matters um, to me. Uh, you know, but but the thing we have to understand is that communism is different from social justice. You know, communism is 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 a, is a harsh political system and ideological, as you pointed out. Yeah, the ideology of it, the fact that it cannot tolerate other ways of thinking, um, is really the the core, the core kind of one of its core characteristics. And and I wonder, you know, as as um, and and again to get back to the issue of why the European or the American left are so bad at recognizing the challenge um, from China is because they tend to mix up. You know this idea they well, tend they're, to they're, think well, communism is good somehow, they're blinded right? By their romanticism, yeah, and by their own normative belief yeah. in their own power, yeah, yeah, that they are somehow responsible. And but they're not. I mean, China has a lot of the Communist Party of China has a giant amount of agency. They are doing exactly what they want to do, and we need to understand that and recognize it and respect that agency and take them seriously. You know. Right. Yeah. yeah um, I, th- I think so, we've got, um, you know, several more minutes left yeah. Yeah, before we wrap it up. And so, but uh, it, it's been it's been really uh, in depth uh, the, the digging of, uh, you know, the what China really is, uh, you know, like disaggregating mm-hmm. um, the, uh, the um, also the 
what I want to ask you is um, how you view the way in which U.S. is responding to to the you know what it considers yeah. essentially a, a threat from China to the it's uh, messy yeah, yeah it's messy and 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 how effective is the United States and uh, its ally you know Quad um, and as well as like you know. Uh, but other in, uh, you know Southeast Asian allies yeah. that U.S. is uh, courting even this week. Yeah. And then finally, like the second and then last uh, question would be, um, you you talk about the pushback from the uh, communities within China, right? So mm-hmm. like you know this this is natural. Like you know no 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 human community likes to be oppressed eternally, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Maybe for a short it's while. Human nature. But, yeah. Right. And then so this is also scientific physics, right? Like uh, you know yeah. like a Foucauldian. You know, every repression yeah. is going to like uh, invite uh, 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 acts of resistance in yeah. so many forms, right? Yeah. So, the, can can you address those is- uh, the two issues, like uh, the effectiveness of the U.S. strategy or approach to uh, centrally containing, uh, curtailing Chinese or Ch- CCP's influences around the world and power projection, and secondly and finally, um, how do you see the democratic potential? Uh, you know, that may be latent at this moment in Chinese society. Uh, you know, develop- yeah. You know, I think it might come as a surprise to people to to understand that, in fact, a lot of this pushback that we're seeing against the party now coming from America actually didn't really begin in America. In America. It really began in Australia and, um, and, and it's being carried forward very effectively in places like Japan through actual concrete ideas for how to push back, how to manage problems, policy suggestions, and, and more than suggestions, policies. Um, in a way, America was responding to um, alarm bells that really began ringing in Australia. Um, and that was because Australia had a very particular relationship with China and also has a is one of the five eyes and has a, a lot of sort of signals, intelligence abilities, for example, um, and can actually access information. And it was Australia really that began to sound the alarm about a lot of the kind of penetration that was taking place through uh, civil society networks. Um, uh, through Huawei, through the um, there's just been a very interesting report that came out on Bloomberg today about how there is actually um, a system for inserting malware via Huawei um, into telecom systems in the world. It's not the so-called you know back door through widget, but through administrative updates, patches, this kind of thing where malware can be inserted. Um, so you know that. Uh, there were certainly people in the US who were aware of the challenge to their knowledge systems, to their sort of political integrity, and then just general challenges that that open societies have in dealing with with dictatorship. And here I would also point to the experience of Hong Kong, very open society, it's decimated, there's a purge underway in Hong Kong now, Communist Party is purging Hong Kong, I would say. Um, So it's obvious what happens, you know, when a dictatorship takes over or approaches or inserts itself into open societies, actually rather dangerous. Um, but, but in America, America has this absolutely giant Achilles heel, which is, of course, Wall Street, for example, and Silicon Valley, too, which is not American, if you like. These are global. This is global capital. Yeah. And it roves the world as well. Look at BlackRock and their investments in China. Um, Look at Morgan Stanley. Look at the investment banks. All of them. They, they are the truly color, color, yeah. and nationality blind. They <laughs> really are. They they have. They seem to have no loyalty except to to the dollar, as yes. many as possible. And um, and and so this is a huge Achilles heel, if I may put it that way, for the United States. Is that even as they are politically trying to crack down on ties with China, things like technology outflow, which in America is, is really seen as a huge threat to America's knowledge base, to its its national base, to its industrial base. Um, And I think with a lot of justification, actually, when you know what's going on, um, you know, at the same time, they have their own financial class sort of working against them, yeah? So America has this enormous um, difficulty in dealing with itself. Yeah, Wall Wall Street is American beat. But it, it, yeah, it, I mean, it, it cannot be like a, a contained easily. You know, it it's, cannot it's like be. A it cannot. 
Exactly, that's so true. And you know, you'll also hear Japanese officials saying in Japan too, it's immensely difficult for governments to tell private industry or private businesses what to do. And this is all true. And you know, this is supposed to protect us from overreach, from tyranny. Is the the power of businesses to to ensure livelihoods and to ensure profits and therefore wealth and and food and you know shelter and all this. Uh, old thinking about the economy yeah and that's supposed to be what they achieve as well um, good things as well as but yeah it can get can it's it's been running out of control for a long time in the US so so I so I would sort of sort of you know um, the transnational nature the multinational corporations means that they're often working against themselves so it's a mixed picture for now but I think there have been some important initiatives and I think that um as I said, I don't think that they all came from America at all, and it's important to understand that. Um, on, on the second issue of the democratic potential, I think that's really, really difficult right now within China. Um, I don't see much um, room there. Um, we see in Hong Kong how difficult, impossible it is to resist. I mean, you know, I was last in Hong Kong in September 2019, and there were hundreds of thousands of people on the streets. We all saw the pictures on TV. It was extraordinary. The depth and the breadth of feeling was, I mean, it was incredibly, it was extraordinary. There's no other word for it. Um, millions of people were involved. Well, um, there were, I mean, uh, there And it didn't work. Collective, collective future. And it didn't work. Was under threat. Exactly. Right? And it didn't work. Yeah, look at Hong Kong today. Jimmy Lai gets 13 months in prison over the age of 74, 75 um, for turning up at a memorial to remember a massacre. It didn't work. So what is our capacity to protect our societies from this kind of creeping dictatorship? Um, yeah, I mean... That's a question well, I mean, maybe for another time. Yeah, <laughs> I well, don't want well, to talk I mean, too like, long. Uh, People have been very are, patient we, already. We yeah. are looking into a, a yeah. dark abyss here because, mm. uh, you know, under um, Mao, China was on the perpetual verge of famine, mm. uh, you know, the, the, through the, uh, the Communist Party's policy failures. And um, now like, we're looking at uh, possibly the richest um, economy in the world uh, very soon, mm. right? And um, the Maybe. third largest military uh, establishment in the world uh, the, with a At very least. advanced uh, the technology. Second largest, I would say. Yeah, second largest now, yeah. And yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, after the USA. I have, in and, fact, China, the, the People's Liberation Army Navy has more military ships than the American Navy at this point, by the way. The Air Force as well. I recently, Pentagon, um, mm. you know, that came up with the estimate that uh, the, the Chinese Air Force uh, hardware uh, is now the third largest in the world. Okay. And then so so we are looking at a very, very powerful, yeah. uh, essentially uh, um, and anti-humanist um, communist dictatorship, mm. super rich, super technologically mm. advanced. Mm. And then so the, the, the you know and so this yeah. is not a good thought to end this conversation, no. but we also need to be with incredible objective. surveillance powers and incredible yes. powers to manipulate individuals, a lot of political discipline, um, a, a rule of terror domestically in the sense that if you're a Communist Party member, you get into trouble, you go, you get subjected to something called double discipline, which involves torture. It's outside of the legal system. Yeah, you, you, you never go near the legal system. Communist Party punishes its own people and it's a rough business. So, yeah, you know, I mean, I think I think we need to really value um, what good things we have and fight for them and protect them and protect ourselves and think defensively, um, understand that the good things we have may not last forever unless we defend them. And I think that that requires some political compromise as well. Maybe it requires saying, look, I may not like what's happening um, in the US in many ways, but at the end of the day, which is a system which offers more hope of us influencing it for the good, yeah? And we need to yeah, make of course, these of choices. Course. Yeah, like, you know, yeah, that's the, the real world. The, the, la, la, last week, uh, um, the, the host on this uh, um, uh, program uh, was uh, uh, James Dorsey mm -hmm. from the National University of Singapore. He's a, uh, he, he is a senior fellow on Middle Eastern affairs, and mm. you know he's from originally from Morocco. And he said, um, you know, there are only 
a few places, yeah. um, you know, the liberal democracies that um, dissidents and activists and the oppressed turn to, which is the United States and the Euro. Europe. So true. And uh, you know, no, no, ma no matter how hypocritical, uh, the, in quotes, the West may be, uh, we have not nowhere else to turn to if you're exactly. part of the oppressed community exactly so, as as critical and anti-colonial exactly. as i or you may be but i guess yeah. I, we we have to go with imperfect systems yeah and, yeah you probably more than me zani um that's right because i've sort of come to this realization in over the last years that we do have to go with imperfect systems we have to choose the lesser of two evils we have no other rational choice in life it's absolutely essential. And then we have to ensure that we improve the good things rather than just, um, you know, criticizing them and dismissing them. And that's also something that I think is can be quite hard for people. Um, but but it's it's really about survival and for our children, you know. Yeah. Well, thanks yeah. for yeah. Your, uh, wise words. And uh, we will end our conversation today. Thank you so and, much. Uh, you've been listening to uh, Dee Dee Kirsten Tableau, a well-known writer, journalist, and a very seasoned, uh, you know, China analyst uh, from uh, Berlin. Uh, thank you so much, Didi. And, um, thank you. And I'll write something Lovely. up and then like...